uh, go ahead straight forward to the second lecture. Uh, it's about the chest trauma, blunt, blunt or penetrating chest trauma, with a main focus on the management of rib uh, fractures by Dr. Mahmoud Al Khulani. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud Al Khulani is currently in his last month is doing a senior reg for pain uh, medicine and anesthesia in the national training program at the Manchester University Hospitals. And he's starting soon, I think maybe in one or two months, uh, uh, Max, uh, as a consultant uh, job in the same hospitals. Uh, so Dr. Mahmoud's special interest is uh, medical education and he's appointed actually as an honorary uh, lecturer in the Manchester University since 2017. So he's doing that job for the last three years. Uh, so this topic of uh, blunt and penetrating chest trauma with, with a focus on rib fractures carries a very importance or, or clinical importance as it carries a significant mortality and morbidity, particularly in the elderly people. It uh, carries a lot of challenges like pain management, ventilation support, which is again related to the pain management. And as you know, the scoring systems may not be reflecting reliably or predicting the failure of your conservative measures and treatment. So uh, Dr. Mahmoud, uh, please start sharing your presentation and go ahead. Um, right, thank you, Walid, very much. Um, a very good evening to all uh, the audience attending tonight. Uh, I hope all of you guys are staying safe and sound during the uh, second wave of COVID-19, which is um, knocking around, unfortunately, uh, now in a, a very surreal, bizarre year of 2020 that keeps surprising us. Last thing today uh, with, um, fortunately and luckily, uh, Donald Trump uh, losing the elections uh, in the United States. Not that the other candidate is going to be of any benefit to our Middle Eastern um, uh, interests, uh, but it's just an end of an era that needed to end, really. Uh, first of all, I'm really glad uh, to be with you guys here tonight through the um, splendid portal uh, of Saving Lives Academy uh, and my very good friend, uh, Dr. Walid Al-Hefshi. Uh, all greetings as well uh, to the panelists and all greetings to Dr. Ahmad Mahdi. Uh, and thank you very much, really, for his very interesting uh, lecture uh, tonight. Uh, so like Walid said, there is a little bit of tweak uh, in the topic. So the announcement was I'm going to talk about blunt and penetrating uh, chest injury. Uh, but to be perfectly honest with you, I always uh, try to focus on areas where we can actually um, achieve some improvement in the quality of care, if I can see that, uh, say that, sorry, uh, uh, where there is potentials for improvement. And one of these major areas, actually, uh, when we are talking about chest uh, wall trauma, is the management of rib fractures. The bigger picture is more of surgical emergency medicine um, problem. Yes, we are involved in it, but we are more closely involved with the management of rib fractures. Uh, and this is why tonight I wanted to focus on this more uh, rather than talking about the wider uh, picture, uh, which has more input from our colleagues uh, in surgery and emergency medicine. Uh, so let's delve um, in our topic today. So first of all, conflicts of interest. I have none to declare uh, here uh, talking about this topic. Uh, my objectives tonight talking about this important topic is to uh, shed light on the relevance uh, of rib fractures. Uh, why do we think it's an important area of practice uh, that we need to improve and focus on? Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how to approach uh, a referred patient uh, with rib fractures, how to assess those patients, uh, if there are any scoring systems in place that they might aid us and how reliable those scoring systems are. Uh, and then talking a little bit about management, specifically about analgesia, which makes a huge difference uh, in the outcome of those patients. Uh, and then again, shedding a little bit of light of how to develop a government system in place uh, to monitor what we do with those patients and the outcome uh, that we might have. Uh, so first of all, uh, wh why rib fracture topic is really important. And numbers tell us that at least one in every five trauma patients uh, will present with some sort of rib fracture uh, of some description. Unfortunately, this condition comes with high morbidity and mortality. 
uh, for obvious reasons that we are all aware about. So you have patients with rib fractures, they are struggling to deep breathe and cough, and they end up having desaturation, needing ventilatory support, uh, maybe developing uh, some sort of pneumonia. Um, and then this leads directly to mortality. And this has direct impact on uh, healthcare systems. All healthcare systems nowadays are thinking money, how to save money, and that will never happen without improving the quality of care to our patients. So if, you, if this cohort of patient is not managed appropriately, unfortunately, you're talking about lengthy hospital stay, uh, need for critical care, and now we are talking COVID. Uh, and COVID era where uh, ICU beds are really precious. Um, so managing them appropriately from the outset helps to minimize all the burden on, on the healthcare system. Uh, chest injuries per se account for up to 25% of deaths uh, related to uh, trauma. Even if you have survivors from uh, this condition, uh, they, they will carry on struggling with chronic pain conditions. Uh, need for long-term rehabilitation and delayed return to productivity uh, and work. And talking about Europe and talking about UK um, with elderly aging population, this even becomes worse when you're faced with elderly frail patients coming with rib fractures um, and then developing respiratory failure and you're in very uh, uh, difficult situation needing to make decisions whether it's appropriate to intubate and ventilate those patients uh, because of their rib fractures and the on effects uh, of, of such problem, or you just will palliate and keep them comfortable uh, and not escalate their care. How do we fracture uh, ribs? The most common is blunt chest trauma. Uh, in youngsters, as we would expect, the most common cause is having high impact injury. Uh, secondary to road traffic accident, uh, while when we talk about the elderly uh, group of patients, uh, this happens more because of trivial injury, most probably uh, losing balance and falling from standing height and banging their chest against something and fracturing a uh, few ribs, and we, su we see this quite often uh, in our practice. There are other uh, definitely uh, less common causes, like penetrating trauma, like uh, knife injury, for example, and the knife crime here in UK is not uncommon, unfortunately. Uh, maybe compared to North America, United States, uh, they have more of gun shoots. Here we have more of uh, knife injury because the, 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 the um, acquiring or keeping a firearm is something not common or legal here in UK, luckily. Uh, this might be st stress fractures, secondary to coughing, or you can see it in athletes. Um, and other uh, less common uh, reasons. Uh, one of them is quite interesting actually, which is in pediatric patients. And this should directly raise your suspicion about non-accidental uh, injury and what it will bring about in terms of safeguarding, etc. Just a little bit of anatomy that we are all aware about just to refresh our minds about uh, where the ribs are set, uh, situated in our thoracic cage and what to expect. So we know that they are paired structures. Uh, the first seven of them, we call them true uh, ribs because they articulate anteriorly uh, with the costal cartilage and posteriorly with the transverse process uh, of the dorsal uh, vertebrae. Uh, while the lower ones, eight uh, to 12, they are called false because they don't have anterior uh, articulation. And from 10 to 12, they are called floating ribs. Uh, because the movement and excursion is higher compared to the other ribs. Uh, the underneath uh, of the ribs has the neurovascular bundle running in a groove, and this includes the intercostal uh, nerves and uh, vessels as well, uh, which can get injured, unfortunately, during fracture, uh, leading to bleeding and hemothorax uh, uh, or long-term neuropathic pain conditions uh, after the healing process. One of the very important things that um, are actually very important indicators when talking about trip fractures uh, is the term of flail segment, which can be diagnosed radiologically and clinically. And necessarily you won't have correlation between both because you can have clinical flail chest when it's not evident radiologically and vice versa. So you have actually to combine both assessments in order to judge 
uh, a flail segment. And the significance of that, like what we're going to see later uh, in the scoring systems, is it leads to high mortality because it leads to inefficient ventilation. Uh, where clinically, you will find the chest wall, the segment that's broken, moving paradoxically. So during an inspiration, uh, instead of moving out, it will be sucked in and impair ventilation. And during expiration, it will move the other way uh, around and impair uh, proper emptying uh, of the lungs uh, and compromise ventilation. While radiologically, actually, when you see three consecutive ribs uh, broken at two or more sites, this raises your suspicion uh, about the, um, the, the risk of having a flail segment, and you have to search for this uh, clinically to prove or disprove, and then um, uh, plan your management uh, consequently, especially flail segment, like we'll, what we'll say uh, later, is one of the uh, most evidence-based indications uh, for surgical fixation of fractured ribs. What are the consequences then, as what we all will appreciate, uh, there is direct impact on ventilation. Uh, you're having a patient in terrible pain, uh, maybe elderly with limited physiologic reserve, they are not able to deep breathe, they are not able to cough and get rid of secretions, and they are doing rapid shallow breathing, so this is going to affect their oxygenation and ventilation. And they might need varying degrees of support with supplemental oxygen, including non-invasive or even invasive uh, ventilation. They might end up developing pneumonia, and this carries actually a high mortality risk, especially in elderly patients, leading to doubling of their mortality. Underlying the rib fractures, invariably you will find some sort of lung contusion, which might not be evident initially on your chest, uh, chest X-ray, but they will be evident on the CT scan, and those as well uh, carry the risk of developing infection. Uh, and their natural course is uh, spontaneous resolution if things don't uh, complicate. You might get uh, injuries because of the sharp ribs that are broken to the lung, to the pleura, uh, and to the neurovascular bundle, uh, leading to development of hemothorax or pneumothorax, uh, or both of them. That's definitely in addition uh, to the bigger picture. You, you're having a major trauma patient, and they might have different sorts of other injuries, including traumatic brain injury or injury uh, to internal organs uh, as well. And we're going to shed light on that while we are talking uh, about assessment. Uh, when you come across those patients, uh, there are some indicators that would, will tell you that that's a severe injury. One of them, like we mentioned, is having a flail segment, as well as having fracture of the sternum, which tells you that this is a high impact injury. Uh, scapular fracture, uh, as well, will raise suspicion about severity of this um, trauma. Uh, and if you have dislocation of the sternoclavicular joint, if you come across multiple displaced fractures, this tells you as well uh, that that's a severe injury or fractures higher up in the first three ribs, which are naturally protected by the scapulae uh, and where the sternum is situated. And whenever you have these, you have to be very careful with your patient because you might find more serious injury like myocardial contusion, dissection of the aorta, or dissection of the tubes running in the chest, including uh, tracheobronchial tree uh, or the esophagus. Uh, and you have to have as early as possible a uh, trauma CT scan for this patient in order to be able to pick up uh, any uh, injuries of worry that need addressing as soon as possible. Also in that group of patients, there are high risk protectors. And like what we're going to see later, uh, they have been used in order to develop the scoring systems. Uh, one of the very important factors is age of the patient. The older uh, the patient presenting with rib fracture, uh, the more risk of mortality and morbidity. Uh, again, as you would expect uh, in, uh, intuitively, uh, any comorbidities, especially relating to the cardiovascular or respiratory system, uh, increase the mortality and morbidity risk of that group of patients. Uh, and again, number of broken uh, ribs. And if the patient presents or develops early in the course of the problem, uh, any pneumonic process, uh, that will increase the risk of mortality uh, and morbidity. Um, so now you've, you've been uh, on, on, let's say, um, night shift, for example, and the A&E, uh, the emergency department, calls you to assess uh, a rift fracture uh, patient as the anesthetist on call. 
uh, who's skilled in at least managing uh, the acute pain conditions, uh, if not chronic, if you're like myself, with interest in chronic pain uh, medicine. How are you gonna assess those patients? Uh, so here in the UK, the usual practice is to get a CT scan trauma series uh, from the outset as soon as possible, ideally within the first 30 minutes, and that's audited actually during the practice in order to see the extent of the injury and if that's associated with any injuries, which will guide our um, uh, management. Uh, and that's done if the patient is not hemodynamically uh, severely unstable, uh, at which stage you might do a fast scan and then take them to theater, uh, if there is any reason to take them to theater immediately. Um, in the assessment, clinical judgment actually is the cornerstone. Yes, we're going to talk about scoring systems, but your clinical judgment is the cornerstone. You go and you assess the patient. You try to see whether they are able to do deep breathing uh, and coughing or not, whether they are able to use incentive spirometry and how much they are achieving. Normally, we look around two liters uh, as a reassuring number, but they are, if they are struggling and not able to achieve more than that, you need to act promptly and make sure that you're on the top of their pain uh, in order not to have complications and flag them to different teams like what we are gonna say, say later, because it's not a one-man show. It's not only your responsibility as an anesthetist in your position, it's a multidisciplinary management that includes different teams having very important input in the care of those patients. Uh, like we said, definitely if it's a severe trauma, you have to search for other injuries. You have to know whether there is a pneumothorax and whether it's an, an hemothorax that will undergo conservative management uh, because it follows the criteria of conservative management or the patient will, needs, uh, will need an insertion of a chest strain, which is usually done here in UK uh, by our surgical or thoracic surgery uh, colleagues in A&E or the trauma team leader uh, in A&E. Uh, like we said, um, during practice, varying types of scoring systems uh, have been developed. Uh, to be honest, none of them is superior. No, none of them is perfect at all. Uh, they use different variables in order to try to uh, anticipate mortality and morbidity, uh, anticipate the severity of the condition uh, to help stratify the patients, which patient is going to be admitted to the ward, which one needs to be admitted to high dependency unit, and what sort of analgesia. Uh, is going to be followed. To be perfectly honest, to my own understanding, your clinical judgment outweighs those scoring system. And the only reason that it's beneficial to have this scoring system in, in, in place is to have some sort of auditing tool. Uh, we collect data all the time. And if you say that, okay, I received those number of rib fracture patients with that sort of severity, and we did this sort of management and the outcomes were such and such, this will help you to know where are you standing in the care of that group of patients rather than randomly uh, managing them and not knowing whether what you're doing is effective enough uh, or not. Uh, all of these scoring systems invariably incorporate the age because age is a very important factor uh, in the mortality, morbidity and outcome uh, of that group of patients and also the number of fractured ribs uh, as well. There are a number of them. Uh, most commonly, and one of the simplest, is the rib fracture score, like we're going to see in the next slide. Another one is the chest trauma uh, score, uh, and the rib score, which is mainly a radiologic uh, score that's uh, done by our uh, radiology colleagues, uh, and again can delineate uh, the severity of uh, the condition of rib fracture. Uh, in terms of the rib fracture score, uh, you count the number of breaks uh, in the single rib, uh, so whether it's single or multiple, and then you count the sides, whether it's unilateral or bilateral, and use a factor to reflect the age. And in most institutes, if the patient is scoring seven or more, those patients have to be flagged to the acute pain team to keep them on their radar uh, all through the care of them of those patients in hospital in order to see whether they need escalation with the plan of analgesia or escalation uh, with care or not. And the acute pain team is always situated in a good position as gatekeeper uh, for that group of patients uh, to monitor them and look after uh, their care unless they, they, they present in a more severe trauma and from the outset they have been intubated and admitted to the ICU. 
Unfortunately, this uh, score is not good enough uh, when it comes to the respiratory morbidity and mortality, and hence it's, it's not uh, a perfect single uh, predictor, outcome, predictor uh, outcome score, and you need multiple factors in order to be able to judge the outcome of that group of patients. Another one that we talked about is the chest trauma uh, score. Uh, again, it uses a number of variables, including the age, uh, the number of ribs that have been uh, fractured, uh, and the pulmonary uh, contusion uh, that will be diagnosed by our radiology uh, colleagues. And it adds extra points, actually, uh, if there is bilaterality uh, in the fracture uh, of those ribs. Uh, and it's been designed essentially uh, to predict the first 24 hour um, morbidity and mortality of that group of patients. Uh, talking about the scoring system, I think the most important take home message is in your practice, in your hospital, try to design some tool. Uh, you're not gonna invent uh, the bicycle. There are many tools uh, online and available from different trauma centers in Europe and in North America or Australia and New Zealand. Pick up one and use it as a tool just to stratify your patients and see what sort of patients you receive to your hospital and what sort of management you do to those patients and whether it's uh, enough uh, or not. Uh, one of the other tools that's widely used here in, in UK uh, has been developed after a multicentric study uh, called the study evaluating the impact of a prognostic model for management of blunt chest wall trauma patients, uh, simply stumble. Uh, stumble actually English word, you know, like stumbling in your uh, movement. Uh, and it used number of variables, including age, uh, including the respiratory comorbidities, uh, whether the patients are anticoagulants or not, and that's not an uncommon encounter, especially in elderly patients uh, who present with atrial fibrillation and they are on anticoagulation for their atrial fibrillation, and whether they have underlying uh, chronic lung disease or not, and how many ribs have been fractured. It's a very useful piece of tool. Uh, it can delineate your patients in, according to severity into mild, moderate, and severe and helps the management of those patients and helps creating um, care pathways like I'm gonna show you in the uh, next few slides, uh, one quoted from the University Hospital of Plymouth, uh, which is leading in England in terms of uh, dealing with rib fracture patients and managing them, which you can easily adopt in your institute in order to look after that group uh, of patients. And that sort of tool, is actually good as a predictor of mortality and morbidity uh, of that group of patients. Now that we've talked about um, how patients present in terms of how they fracture the, their ribs, how you're going to assess uh, them uh, and diagnose their condition and deal with them initially uh, when they came, uh, now we come to the very important um, reason or essence uh, from this lecture tonight, which is actually how you're gonna treat those patients. Evidence tells us that it's not a one-man show uh, treatment. Uh, it needs to be multidisciplinary. And by saying that, uh, from the outset, you involve the emergency department. Uh, invariably, you will involve the critical care or the outreach team in the care of this pa those patients in order to keep them uh, on their radar in case they need any escalation at any stage. As an anesthetist slash pain management specialist, uh, including the pain management specialist nurses, you, you have to be involved in the care of those patients because you have the knowledge and the skills like what we're gonna discuss later and how to offer them analgesia to help that group of patients. Physiotherapy, they are in the center of the care of those patients and they are looked after by our physiotherapy colleagues who help them with um, orientation, and practice of deep breathing, coughing exercises uh, in order to help uh, them with the speeding up their recovery. And ideally, this management should be within a, a written protocol uh, that everyone follows and they trigger cer certain pathways as soon as they hit uh, the emergency department uh, in their hospital. And that's not an impossible thing to develop, actually. You can develop this sort of 
uh, protocol and by practicing and auditing and reflecting on the quality of your practice, you can improve the quality of care of that group of patients. Your management will focus around certain points, as you would expect, definitely ventilation and oxygenation. They might need variable types of oxygen supplement, starting from the simple face mask or nasal cannulae, up to the use of high flow nasal cannulae or non-invasive ventilation. And sometimes that the condition is really severe or due to other injuries, invariably they might need to be intubated and ventilated uh, on the critical care unit. So that's one of the areas where you're gonna manage those patients. One of the cornerstones which brings about our role as anesthetists and vein specialists is, is the management of analgesia for those patients. By all means, it has to be multimodal. Uh, you can't actually depend on just single uh, mood of uh, analgesia. Uh, you're gonna use the simple analgesia. You're gonna follow the WHO ladder of analgesia, which as all, you, all of you know, was developed initially for cancer patients, but it's been uh, extrapolated to all uh, acute painful conditions. So you're gonna use simple analgesia, including non steroidal if there are no contraindications. You're gonna use opiates up to using PCA uh, opiates, but you have to be careful when you're dealing with uh, elderly patients. And you're gonna use as well adjuvants and one of the commonest to be used in that group of patients. Not that it's supported by strong evidence, but you'll find most of trauma centers using them, gabapentinoids like pregabalin and gabapentin. And again, you have to be careful uh, when you're using them in that group of uh, patients. And most importantly, and like you can say, I put many pluses uh, beside it, using regional techniques are, as we're gonna elaborate uh, later, which actually are the golden uh, standard for the management of analgesia uh, for that group of patients. Like we said, physiotherapy, you will need their help. So make sure that they are involved as early as possible uh, in the care of that group of uh, patients. Uh, and you have to consider escalation of care from ward level of care to level two or level three, according to what's needed for those patients. And all of you would appreciate how tight and difficult is it to get a high dependency or ICU pay, uh, bed uh, during the COVID circumstances when most of hospitals, at least here in UK, while I'm talking to you, are being overwhelmed by uh, COVID patients. Um, like we said, the elderly patients are a very important group. You have to be careful. You will need to make a lot of decisions about them so you'd, you'd better manage them appropriately from the outset in order not to end up in a difficult situation where you need to make a decision about whether you're gonna escalate or not. And ideally, you have to involve the, the authors, your attritions, uh, in the care of that group of patients because they are best situated to deal with them in case they have cognitive impairment uh, or in case they have any element of uh, delirium or Alzheimer disease and you will be able to deal with these changes because they are experts uh, in that area. And last but not least, consideration by our uh, orthopedic or thoracic surgery colleagues, uh, whether those patients are amenable uh, for fixing their fractures or not. And we're gonna touch base on that uh, at the end of the lecture. Uh, like I said, developing a protocol is really important. I quoted this protocol from University Hospital of uh, Blymouth, and like I said, uh, they are leading in, in the management of that group of patients. They had very important role in the Istanbul uh, study and the score. And like you can see here, uh, it's color-coded uh, pathway, green, amber, and red. Uh, and uh, it delineates the severity uh, of patients pre presenting with red fractures. It's multidisciplinary in essence, like we said, it's not a one-man show. Uh, and then according to the severity, you involve other teams and use different modes of analgesia, uh, including most importantly, uh, the use of regional techniques uh, for the care of those patients. So make sure that in your department, uh, you discuss it with your uh, colleagues, you discuss it with your seniors, and you try to develop some sort of pathway uh, for the care of those patients, audit it all the time and reflect on your practice to see where are you standing in terms of the care of those patients. I'm not going to mention the specific analgesia that they mentioned here in, in their uh, protocols, especially opiates, because it's different from one place uh, to another and different from one country uh, to another. Uh, but you have to be sensible with what you use up to using PCA. And like we said, uh, think always uh, when you, you, you need to step in with a regional anesthetic technique in order to be able to deal uh, with those patients and improve their care. 
Uh, now we come to the juicy part of the um, lecture, which is talking about regional and anesthetic techniques. Um, and we can actually break them into two major uh, types, old school types of analgesia, including thoracic epidural and paravertebral uh, block, and the newer techniques, the fascial uh, plane block techniques using ultrasound and using catheters that are every few years, you will find a new one, sometimes every few months actually, you will find a new one emerging uh, and gaining turf in the care of that group of patients or even in the care of thoracic uh, surgery when it's unilateral in thoracotomy. Uh, the exact details of those topics are actually beyond uh, the scope of this lecture because they are a lecture on, on, on their own, uh, but we'll try to touch base uh, quickly about what are the commonest ones used in practice uh, here in the UK and I think might be in different countries as well, and what are the pros and cons of each of them. Uh, thoracic epidural, of course, it sits at the top uh, as a golden, uh, um, golden I, I won't say standard, uh, as in terms of uh, highest quality analgesia that can be offered to that group of patients, especially if the patients are presenting with bilateral rib, rib fractures, but unfortunately it does come with a number of caveats. Um, so sometimes it's difficult to perform if you're not used to using them, especially nowadays for um, laparotomy or for thoracotomy. Um, uh, clinicians and surgeons are moving away from using thoracic epidurals. Uh, those patients are trauma patients. Bear in mind that they might come with some sort of spinal fracture or contusion of the spinal cord, and you don't want to go near them. Uh, with your needle if this problem is in place until they are cleared from the neurosurgical side. Uh, like we said, elderly patients invariably come in with uh, anticoagulation on board. Uh, you won't be able to stick your needle if that's uh, the condition. You're going to compromise the hemodynamics of those patients if you're going to run a thoracic epidural infusion, and invariably you'll find yourself needing arterial line, central line, vasopressors, most commonly noradrenaline, and needing to admit them in a monitored area. And sometimes, like I said, I'm keeping repeating myself, but in the COVID era, uh, that's not something easily accessible uh, for that group of patients. Uh, so you're gonna complicate their care because you're only offering them thoracic epidural. Uh, the other modality of analgesia that again falls under the category of the old school is the use of ultrasound guided for a vertebral block and catheter. Um, the risk of causing hemodynamic compromise is less in that group of patients because uh, there is less risk of causing sympathetic blockade. It can be offered unilaterally or bilaterally. It doesn't have the impact on mobility that you're going to have with thoracic epidural. Most wards are trained and are happy to look after that group of patients. But again, it's not that easy to perform. It needs learning curve. Uh, to develop, so you need your center to be doing good number of them for you to be competent uh, in offering those uh, paravertebral uh, blocks and having trained teams uh, to look after those group of patients. And if you go back to the anatomy of the paravertebral space, you're very close to the pleura, so you run the risk of injuring the pleura if you're not well trained. Having said that, most of those patients might have pneumothorax and chest drain in, in place, but that doesn't mean under any circumstances that you will be reckless and go uh, with your needle inside and then cause injury uh, to those patients. Um, so you have to be careful and you have to learn them well. Then came the, neural, uh, the, the newer uh, blocks that actually revolutionized the care uh, of that group of patients. And by name, I'm talking here about the erector spiny uh, plane block and catheter and the serratus anterior uh, plane block and catheter. Um, in, in my current hospital, uh, we do paravertebral blocks. Uh, in, my, in one of my previous hospitals, uh, where I was trained in, in pain medicine, we do more of paravertebral, uh, erector spiny, and serratus. And the beauty of uh, the fascial plane blocks, actually, is the margin of safety that they have, the easiness of learning them, uh, uh, I won't be exaggerating if I say you can actually learn them if you're good at regional uh, ultrasound guided regional blocks and needling. You can actually learn them off YouTube uh, if you want. Uh, you don't need to watch them many times in order to feel confident uh, to hold the probe and hold the needle uh, and start doing them. 
The R safe evidence tells us that they are safe in anticoagulated patients uh, to perform because the worst case scenario if the patient develops a hematoma will be in a fascial plane, it will be contained and won't need too much complications like cord compression, for instance, uh, if we are talking about thoracic epidural. They are equally effective, but the downside of them, because they are relatively, relatively new, so we don't have robust uh, randomized controlled trials comparing them to the old school um, uh, techniques, and we don't have studies in place um, uh, evaluating their mortality benefit. Similar thing, by the way, applies to thoracic epidural. So we said it's the golden uh, standard in terms of analgesia, but it doesn't cause much difference uh, in mortality of those patients. But those erector spiny and serratus anterior have revolutionized the care of those patients. I, and I would urge all uh, the audience listening to me tonight to try to endeavor and persevere learning those techniques in order to improve the care of that group of patients. And even if you're dealing with unilateral thoracotomy or breast surgery uh, with serratus anterior, this are, these are very valuable uh, newer uh, block techniques uh, that are gaining, like I said, turf in different areas of analgesia and anesthesia. Um, sorry that I, I didn't put a video uh, on because of copyrights uh, issues. Uh, but here, what you can see, those photos are taken from uh, uh, the internet, from Google, actually. Uh, like you can see here on the right-hand side, uh, you can see uh, the erector spiny muscles. Um, and what you do, actually, you go in plane uh, with a high-resolution uh, probe, and you start scanning from lateral, where you find the, the rounded shadow uh, of the ribs, and you scan slowly, immediately, until... Uh, the shadow that you can see is squared off, uh, telling you that now you are standing on the transverse process uh, of uh, the vertebrae. You choose a level that lies in between the fractures and you're expecting spread above and below where you're doing your block. Uh, you go in plane with an in plane technique from the top or the bottom. And what you're aiming for actually, you're, you have an end point. What you're aiming for is the transverse process under the erector spiny muscle in the plane uh, between the transverse process and uh, the erector spiny muscle, and you inject your local anesthetic. It's a fascial plane block, it's a volume block. You need big volume, up to 40 mils uh, of Robivacain. We use Robivacain 0.75%, uh, uh, or you can use Levopovivacain if that's what you use in your practice, and you use big volume. You see this space opening in front of you, you hydrodissect it with your local anesthetic, and then you spread a catheter in this place. Just one of the tips that some of the clinicians do sometimes, they do the hydrodissection by saline, so that if the catheter gets displaced, they don't get initial analgesia by the local they injected. And then when they run the infusion by the catheter, they get called a few hours later telling them that the patient is in terrible pain. And then they go con confused. Is it a problem with the catheter? Is it a problem with the block? So they hydrodissect with saline. And when the catheter is in, this is when they put their local anesthetic to be sure that the catheter was in the right place and the local anesthetic uh, went through uh, causing the uh, analgesic effect, and then they run uh, infusion. Similar thing, I think, applies to most of uh, fascial plane blocks, including fascia iliaca for neck of femur fracture, and including serratus anterior and different sorts of uh, fascial plane uh, blocks. Serratus anterior is the other one. Uh, I forgot to say that um, the strongest indication for erector spiny is if you're dealing with posterolateral lateral fracture. So the ribs got broken actually at different areas. So if you're dealing with a posterolateral lateral fracture, uh, definitely paravertebral and thoracic epidural will cover that. But if you're going for a facial plane block, so erector spiny is excellent for posterolateral lateral fractures. Uh, while if you're talking about serratus anterior, you're talking more about an anterolateral uh, fracture that you want to cover. Uh, like you can see from this picture, you go into the anterior axillary line at the level of the fifth, uh, um, uh, uh, fifth rib. 
actually this area is is very famous and very popular for different sorts of block so coming from underneath the clavicle you can do the infraclavicular brachial plexus block for various indications that's out of the scope of our lecture today going down um, uh, to your second rib you can do what we call pix1 uh, block between pectoralis major and pectoralis minor where you, where you use it for breast surgery or insertion of pacemaker etc and going down to the third rib you can do pix2 block that some people actually say the PIX2 is the same as serratus anterior. Now we are focusing on serratus anterior. You see the ribs. And then um, it was described by Blanco and uh, colleagues. Um, you can either deposit your local anesthetic. It's again volume, fascial blame block, either deep to the serratus anterior. Uh, so you go down to the ribs and you put your local anesthetic in. Uh, or superficial to the serratus anterior between the latissimus dorsi uh, and the serratus anterior, like uh, the, this, this uh, picture uh, shows on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, you put local anesthetic and then uh, you put your catheter and you run infusion uh, afterwards. And in, in practice, what I find personally in practice is if you combine this with PCA and simple analgesia, you get the best effect. And if you go and follow up your patients, you'll find that their use of opiates via the PCA is minimal uh, compared to just PCA uh, without one of those fascial plane blocks. Like I said, they are easy to perform. Actually, some of the anesthetic uh, um, uh, practitioners, and that's a job in North America and to smaller extent here in England, uh, some of them are actually trained to do regional blocks. They are very good at needling and the use of ultrasound. And you can just send them to evaluate those patients and, and do blocks for, for them. And they are happy to do them. And this tells you how easy uh, those blocks are, uh, could be done and how safe they are uh, to trust a non-physician uh, to go and do those uh, blocks for uh, patients. Um, now comes uh, another modality of management, and that's actually uh, falls in the hands of our surgical colleagues, uh, which is the use of surgical fixation. Uh, here in the UK, the practice is really very, very variable. Uh, it could be done by orthopedic surgeons. It could be done by thoracic surgeons. Uh, it's variable in the timing of uh, doing those uh, surgical fixations and uh, variable in the indication. But the strongest evidence-based indication that's recommended by NICE, which develops most of the guidelines uh, that we use in practice here in UK, is having someone with flail segment that's needing mechanical ventilation. And the reason behind that, you need those patients to have effective ventilation when you fix uh, the flail segment, uh, and then you liberate them uh, of uh, mechanical ventilation. Surgical fixation was very fashionable at a certain point. Unfortunately, it went out of fashion uh, at certain stage with all the improvements in the critical care uh, that could be offered to those patients, including weaning for mechanical ventilation, uh, the non-invasive uh, ventilation techniques, etc. Uh, but then it regained uh, popularity again uh, because it helps weaning those patients from mechanical ventilation. Other hospitals might follow other indications uh, for uh, rib fixation surgically. And as you can appreciate from this slide, they all revolve uh, around the severity, the number of fractures, the need of uh, mechanical ventilation, the development of respiratory morbidity, which would make them think uh, about fixing those ribs. Um, orthopedic surgeons uh, in our hospital get involved in that as early as possible. You do 3D recon reconstruction of your CT scan in order to be able to judge whether those reps are amenable for uh, fixation or not, and then you take it from there. Uh, some contraindications, uh, yes, if you have other conditions uh, that preclude uh, putting the patients at risk of uh, fixation. Uh, you're dealing with a trauma patient. They might have traumatic brain injury. They might have very tight brain uh, in terms of ICP and cerebral perfusion, and you won't put them at risk of surgery, which invariably needs one lung ventilation and compromise of oxygenation and ventilation, which might have risk on their cerebral perfusion pressure, especially if you're not anticipating to wean and extubate them any soon, and they are well analgesed and well sedated on ICU, so you can carry on uh, looking after them without fixation. 
um, until everything improves. And by that time, pain secondary to rib fractures won't be much uh, of an issue in order to wean and extubate them. The other thing, as you would expect, you're putting, putting metal work in place. So if there is infection and empyema, you would try to abstain from uh, doing surgical fixation for them in order not to complicate uh, the problem. But like I said, this falls in the hands of our surgical colleagues. It's not our uh, decision, but it's one of the things, if you are in the ICU, you're struggling with the ventilation of your patients, you'd like to wean them, uh, and you think that surgical uh, approach uh, might be helpful, get hold of your uh, colleagues if they are trained in doing rib fixation. Um, then last, uh, before, uh, before summarizing my uh, talk tonight, governance. Uh, it's very important when you have certain group of patients where you think that you can improve the quality of care that you offer them to have a governance system in place. One of the first things that you will, you will have to do is to collect data. You have to see the number of rib fractures uh, that come to you uh, every quarter uh, of the year and um, what sort of severity uh, those patients presented with, things like age group, what sort of management, whether all the teams that are su supposed to look after those patients replied uh, to their quest of reviewing them on a timely fashion, and what were their action and documentation in the notes of the patient, and always reflect on that uh, in order to improve the quality of care of those patients. Ideally, you should protocolize the care of those patients by adopting one of the pathways that are available uh, from different trauma centers uh, and put these in place, tra train your teams uh, and different uh, members of the multidisciplinary team on following those protocols for the care uh, of, their, of those patients and always audit and reflect uh, what you're doing for that very important uh, group of patients. To summarize my talk tonight, like we said, uh, rib fracture uh, is an imp important area of practice, and we are in the center of the care of those patients as anesthetists slash pain specialists, because it carries higher risk of morbidity and mortality for that group of patients. Even with optimal management from the outset, those patients down the line uh, will not regain their function uh, straight ahead, they will need rehabilitation, and they might go on and develop a chronic pain uh, condition, and then I will see them uh, in my clinic. And hence, uh, proper management of them is paramount, and it should be through a, a multidisciplinary uh, team like we explained uh, during the lecture. Thank you very much for your listening, and I'm happy to receive any questions. Thank you, Alid. Uh, perfect, lovely lecture, uh, Dr. Mahmoud, as usual. Um, and here we have two questions, then I have one or two myself, but I will start with our guests here. So the first question from uh, Muhammad Mokbil, uh, what is the role of ultrasound in assessment of rib fractures? Uh, it does have a role, uh, not directly in assessing the fractures themselves, because as, as you would know, when you use ultrasound, uh, they, they get reflected from bone. Um, so you won't be able to assess them. Uh, but you can assess the excursion of the diaphragm. You can assess if they have pneumothorax or hemothorax um, and make your decision based in, on, on that. If your patient's quickly deteriorating and you're not sure what's happening exactly and you don't have time to image them. But like I said, here in UK, uh, almost all trauma patients will have access uh, to trauma CT in timely fashion and this gets audited. Uh, but if the patient's too unstable to be moved to the radiology suite, uh, you can do, if you're trained, I'm, I'm not trained in fast scan, but I can do chest ultrasound. Uh, if you're trained in fast scan, do it, including the lungs, to see if there is any big amount of hemothorax or pneumothorax, which will definitely uh, make a huge difference if in, your, if in, your, in your management. Uh, you might need to stick for acostomies uh, bilaterally, uh, or even in extremes, if your patient develops cardiac arrest, going for clamshell, um, which actually was a, a juicy topic that I was thinking, shall I talk about it in blunt and penetrating trauma or not? But I thought it's heroic act. We've, we, we do it in, in a and &E, not me personally. I, I, I'm, I'm part of the team that might end up doing that. Uh, and uh, one of the patients that we had to do uh, resuscitated thoracotomy, I transfused him uh, in total uh, 62 units of blood 
half of that of uh, fresh frozen plasma, half of that of platelets, and half of that of cryo. And as you would expect, the patient died. So it's a heroic act, but the outcome is very poor. So this is why I thought rib fracture is something that gives favorable outcome and it can make a difference. But in, in, in answer to your question, this is where you're going to use ultrasound when you're looking after rib fracture patients. Uh, okay, Dr. Mahmoud, uh, if you don't mind, we'll start the poll to assess this picture and document the attendance uh, while we're going ahead with the questions. Um, I may add to that, if you agree with me, uh, ultrasound can be used to assess for, as you mentioned, uh, the pneumothorax or the sequence of the trauma, lung contusions, hemothorax, pneumothorax, uh, cardiac contusions with echo, uh, aortic dissection, uh, there's a lot of use in EFAS. But what I'm concerned with, if one is doing ultrasound lung with a patient with multiple rib fractures, consider the patient pain management first, if you can, because keeping pressing on the patient's chest is something it's, which is very painful and may lead to more and more tachycardia and may lead to consequences that we are all not in need of in that scenario. So, yeah, and, and, and the last thing, I would recommend against is everyone is coming with the ultrasound and examining the patient at different instances. So like if you examine the patient and you're confident enough, you're the most senior person using the ultrasound in this scenario that's well and good, document not to repeat the exam again. So again, for this patient with multiple fracture ribs or fracture sternum, he's in severe agony and, and repeating an exam once and after or twice would be something the patient himself is, is is not pleasant with so uh, the, you don't put you don't want to put your patient in in severe agony actually that's inhuman uh, so you have to be sensible about what you're doing and, and make sure that it's actually put yourself in the shoes of the patient really and make sure that it's an examination that's gonna have some sort of outcome or you make a, you're gonna make a decision not just as a matter of practice okay uh, Dr. Mahmoud so uh, what's what about intercostal nerve block in pain management uh, rather than um, rectospiny block or epidural or whatever. So what's um, that's, that's a very, uh, very important question. And I was anticipating this question. Uh, intercostal uh, blocks have been uh, through history, <laughs> like very important modality for the management of that group of patients. But just bear in mind uh, that you will need to do multiple levels. Um, the absorption from uh, the neurovascular bundle is really high. So if you use big volume of local anesthetic, uh, you're going to uh, put this patient at risk of local anesthetic toxicity. Uh, it's very difficult to put a catheter. So most probably you will need to go back again and again and again to do multiple injections, which practically is really difficult and even further increases the risk uh, of local anesthetic toxicity. So theoretically, the answer is yes, they do have a place. But in reality, uh, it's not practical. Uh, perfect. I think we answered this question now. So uh, the next one is, can we start gabapentin or pregabalin in the pre- and post-operative period to decrease uh, the incidence of chronic pain? So is there any rule for chronic pain medications in the acute pain stage? Uh, you will find gabapentinoids invariably uh, used in, 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 in that context uh, in acute pain thinking uh, that we're going to minimize the risk of developing chronic pain. Unfortunately, I'll disappoint you. The evidence uh, behind that is really slim. Uh, actually, a lot of people have a lot of reservation around gabapentinoids uh, after they were very, very popular uh, at certain stage. They are controlled drugs now in UK, so they are dealt with as controlled drugs. Pregabalin actually gets traded in prisons. And we see a lot of patients coming from prison with painful conditions, and we look after them, and we try to avoid uh, prescribing pregabalin uh, for them. Uh, the number need to treat is higher than you would uh, anticipate. Um, so I know they are in different sorts of protocols uh, for the management of acute pain, but the rule in preventing chronic pain is really not proven by evidence, unfortunately. Sorry to say that. Uh, perfect. So I think uh, we are now heading towards the end uh, of this night, wonderful night again. Uh, thanks for everyone attended tonight. We are approaching 400 attendees uh, almost all the time. So thanks for your persistence. And thanks for our uh, guest speakers tonight, uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed Fouad Mahdi, 
and Dr. Mahmoud Al Khulani. See you next week mm -hmm. with two new topics. And uh, please uh, don't forget if you registered already in uh, Critical Care Ultrasound Updates Conference and you didn't get an email yet, please straight away email me because all the emails are already gone. Contact at savinglivesacademy.com. And if you don't register, uh, please uh, go and register now. Um, it's the first time to happen 14 different speakers, seven different countries, 21 uh, essential topics on updates of critical care ultrasound. These people never gathered under one roof. So that's your time and chance to see and listen and watch them. Thanks very much again, Dr. Mahmoud, and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Have a good Take night. Care. See you, bye.